after day, Madrid is bombed, the fourth of the city in ruins. Fascist General Franco threatens that he'll destroy the entire city if it continues to resist. That's one of the reasons why I went to Spain. There were, again, people in the same boat as I was. They were just people, you know. I knew that. There were, <clears throat> well, they say the workers and peasants were defending Madrid. Well, that the hell, that's what I was. I was just a working stiff without a job, I guess. I was a big patriot of the labor movement, and uh, I thought it uh, perhaps was my duty to go and help the Spanish people. I think a lot of these people kind of thought that that we were all we were fighting the same enemies in a way you know that these people were all uh, belong to the same class of people you know the uh, ruling class whether it was in spain or germany or in canada with the slogan spain will be the tomb of fascism the common turn in moscow organized the international brigades in each one of the countries uh, committees were set up for assistance to people who wanted to get to Spain. These committees were formed in various parts of the country. The communist parties in particular, in the various countries, the communist parties of the United States and Canada and Britain and Belgium, Holland, France. In Toronto and Winnipeg and uh, Edmonton and Regina and Vancouver. The communist party was recruiting agents of the people that went to Spain. I was recruited by the party to go. We couldn't see our keenest and most active people drawn off by, to the communists. Secondly, and of course more significant, we shared their feelings that, uh, that uh, the Spanish counter-revolution was fascist, something to which we were instinctively and in principle opposed. I wrote an article in the new commonwealth uh, suggesting very firmly almost as a reality the sending of a uh, hospital by the ccf to the spanish government the left wing the republican government and this produced an astonishing response well the most interesting of course was from dr norman bethune Dr. Norman Bethune was one of the first Canadians to reach Spain in November 1936. He set up a mobile blood transfusion unit and with this revolutionary method saved thousands of lives during his eight-month stay. When Dr. Bethune arrived, the fascist armies were already at the gates of Madrid. The Republican government fled to Valencia, leaving the defense of the capital to the communists. The city was not expected to withstand the assault of Franco's professional troops. A fascist victory seemed imminent. Just when everything seemed lost, a near miracle happened. Newly formed units of the 1st International Brigade marched into Madrid. Anti-fascist Germans and Italians, British riflemen, French cavalry, volunteers from Holland, Belgium, Poland, took up their positions beside the Republican soldiers. They were all dedicated anti-fascists. They were led by seasoned professional soldiers. They helped to save Madrid, and they held it to the very end of the war. In the process, the international brigades became a legend, and volunteers were pouring in from all over Europe and North America. And was interviewed by a man with a pronounced Russian accent who asked me all about my church affiliations, union affiliations, and so forth and so on. I said, boy, I'd like to go. Well, what do you mean you'd like to go? What qualification have you got? Well, I says, I belong to the militia here. He says, good. He says, I think I know somebody, and I'll be getting in touch with you. And he told me to bring my suitcase. And I met him downtown, and he took me to the bus depot and gave me a bus ticket to New York 
Five dollars. I think I got five dollars. Man, that was money. We were a poor, a raggle-taggle group. I think the fare at that time was about 80 or 90 dollars. We picked up an old broken down suitcase in a, in, a, in a pawn shop on 3rd Avenue in New York and we filled it up with some few garments that we thought we would need. And we got on the Ile de France and there were about 360 more passengers, all tourists, all going to France. Everybody on a boat somehow sensed that we were not really legitimate tourists. Of course, when I traveled, it was already against the Canadian law. On my passport, it said that, that it was not valid to travel to Spain, Balearic Islands, or any other islands which were a colony of Spain, you see? But I took that chance. I figured I, in the long run, I didn't think that the Canadian government would mind if I went and fought against the fascist hordes, which eventually would attack the whole world. This is how we felt. The stream was already flowing towards Spain. The French stevedores smelled us out right away, and they sensed who we were, and the first thing they did is they gave us the red front salute. We felt we were in a warm, friendly atmosphere. The French customs officials blinked their eyes the other way and let us through. In Paris, we got connections with more committees of the international brigades. They really welcomed us with open hearts, you know. They, they collected money and they brought us champagne and they brought us food. When we went to the cafes, everybody knew that we were going to Spain. <laughs> we started out from Paris, there were quite a bunch. There was about 80 odd. And we were split up into little groups, each packing a little brown paper parcel with instructions. Okay, comrades, you'll be going to Spain. They just closed the border tonight. You'll be going to Perpignan. People will meet you there. They'll lead you. By this time, there was a group waiting in Perpignan, and there must have been a hundred or more. So we said, well, this is where we get cheap champagne. We'll try some champagne before we die. And, and uh, I'm telling you, it's powerful stuff. Oof. And we had coffee and uh, goat's milk. And I remember that hot goat's milk and that strong coffee. It's a beautiful combination. And so then gradually, we sort of walked out of town, staggered in groups of two and three, about a uh, hundred yards or so apart, to try not to attract attention. Of course, everybody was watching us, I suppose, from all over the place. And then at a certain point, we met. So then we get the final directions there in about four different languages because they come from all over the place. And then he told us what it's going to be like. He says, maybe one, two tough places, he says. He says, maybe they will shoot. He says, well, you know, he says, they can't shoot all of us. We stick and he says, we fight them. He says, and we get through, he says. Don't be scared, he says. He stick together. So that evening, we were all given, we to take off our shoes. We were given our brigadas. I thought, what the hell, walking these things when I got good shoes? Sorry, that's how it's got to be. No talking, no whispering, no smoking. You've got good guides. You walk. You will not talk. You follow one another. I don't think the frontier guards or anything were even bothering with us, you know, because we were going over in groups of 35 up these trails, rocks falling off them. Anybody with half an eye could see it was a lot of people going in one direction, and that was Spain. But the time you hit the top of the Pyrenees Mountains, you start thinking, can I carry through? Because, you know, you're a young person although you felt very revolutionary at that time, but your mind is uh, on the verge of thinking, well, am I doing the right thing? Do I belong here? And by daybreak, all of a sudden, here I'm on Spanish soil. So we stopped, caught our breath, and those that we they packed over, they managed to pick themselves up, and we all sang the international. We were picked up on trucks, on a nearby highway and taken into the fortress at Figueres. And there was this babble of voices, and this was our first contact with Spain. There was the excitement of coming into the Civil War, and it was like a Sunday afternoon picnic. Estranjeros, foreigners, coming to help the government. Every station, the train was met, and we, we had baskets and baskets of oranges. They were dumping the oranges through the windows. We are practically walking a sea of oranges. <laughs> and buns and food and everything everywhere and the people were enthusiastic we were coming to help them <laughs> 